Ian, tell me what interested you about playing James Whale in the film. I'd read the book uh, Father Frankenstein by Christopher Brown. Really enjoyed it. And, uh, and someone said to me, which hadn't occurred to me when I read it, uh, there's a part for you there. I, oh, if they made the movie. And uh, about six months later, uh, Bill Condon, the director of the film, sent me the script. And I was all ready, because I'd, I'd done, not my research, but I, 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 I was really into uh, the man. And of course, I'd made certain connections with him. He's English, as I am. Uh, he was an actor for most of his life in London, doing the same sort of plays that I am often in, new plays and classical plays. When he came to Hollywood, well, I know what it's like to be an Englishman in Hollywood, but he was a gay Englishman, and uh, I know about that too. So uh, I felt, well, here's a part that I won't have to disguise myself too much with. I can feed on, 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 uh, on aspects of my own life and, and apply them to, to well. And, uh, uh, but that, it's not just the part you play, you know, it's the company you do it in. And uh, once I knew Lynn Redgrave was going to be in it, and, um, and talking to Bill Condon, whose grasp of the material is so uh, certain and assured, and we laughed a lot together, I thought it was probably going to be OK. And then when Brendan Fraser came on board, well, who could resist the opportunity of uh, <laughs> seeing Brendan Fraser at close quarters? Um, were you surprised when you read the book that the creator Frankenstein was a, a gay Englishman? Did, had you known his background before? I was an ignoramus. I mean, I, I'd, I'd seen Frankenstein movies on TV, you know, late at night, and I knew The Invisible Man. I'd, I hadn't seen Showboat and knew Paul Robeson singing Old Man River and so on, but uh, that was it. No, it, it, it came the wrong way around for me. I found out more about the man through the book and then went back to look at the movies. And No, there is clearly a gay sensibility at work there, a wonderful witty sense of humor for a start. How did you do the research for the role? I mean, has, has he t um, lived in the 30s and was in Hollywood? Well, I lived in the 30s myself, just, you know, and uh, as I said, there were certain connections that I could feel with him personally, but the research, there's no point in me delving into the genuine biography of Well and coming up with ideas that Christopher Bram didn't want to discuss. And it's a Bram Condon of film and script, and I long, long ago learned that when you're playing a real person, you, you don't play the person, you play the script about the person. But research, I looked at photographs. There are, no, there are no, no film of, of Whale, and, and uh, nor do we know what he sounded like these days, but uh, there, there are plenty of still photographs, and you can tell from that how elegant he was and how upright. And I managed to look a little, little bit like him on a, in certain shots. Um, I talked to a few, a few of his friends who are still around, but they, they have varying views on, on what he was like, and uh, so that was just... I saw the house he lived in, but Goldie Hawn has redecorated it so much you can't tell it was James Wells any longer. So, no, basically just delved into the script and in, into the book, wonderful source material in uh, Father of Frankenstein, the novel. Now, some of the friends that you talked to of his, did they talk about his um, relationship with other men or the fact that he was Well, gay? one of them, Curtis Harrington, was a young man in Paris at the, uh, roughly at the time of, the, of our film, uh, late 50s. And, and Whale is, is uh, vacationing in, in, in Paris, and so is Curtis, and um, uh, they became friends, uh, I think nothing more than that. Uh, and when Whale was leaving Paris, and this impecunious uh, student was going to be left behind with no money to help him enjoy himself, uh, Whale gave him quite a few hundred dollars to um, make his life more comfortable there. So that's a true story. Uh, what else about his life? Uh, I don't know. You'd, uh, I don't think that much is known. And um, he was a rather private person, but quite at ease with uh, being gay. Uh, David Lewis, his lover of, of many years, a studio executive who produced uh, Elizabeth Taylor's movies in the 50s, they lived quite openly in uh, Pacific Palisades and uh, went to openings of movies together. And uh, no one turned a hair, and uh, nor did they. Uh, one shouldn't categorize him as a, an early gay activist. Such things didn't exist in the 30s and 40s, perhaps. But uh, he becomes symbolic and, and, and because um, so few people in Hollywood through the years, even now, uh, of his eminence, uh, find it um, comfortable, to be honest, about their sexuality. 
you mentioned something about you wouldn't necessarily call him a gay activist, but how, why would you say it's important for, um, say, a, a gay generation that's growing up now know about people like James Whale? Well, when I was growing up myself in the United Kingdom in the 40s and 50s, uh, homosexuality was uh, never mentioned uh, at home, at school, at church, uh, uh, in the press, unless, of course, uh, it was uh, some scandalous, uh, dirty story. And that was the image uh, of what it meant to be gay that I grew up with. I had to discover on my own account from uh, friends uh, that uh, the reality was quite different from that. And uh, so if I had had a few positive uh, gay images in my life, uh, had it been, had I understood Michelangelo was gay, had I understood that Benjamin Britten was gay, uh, that John Gielgud was, people I admired uh, for other reasons, uh, and that they were getting on with their lives uh, and um, it was no big deal, uh, you know, they weren't monsters and uh, they weren't gods, then um, I think my life would have been easier. And certainly today, I think it's uh, the fact that increasingly young people, some, are able to come out to their parents in their teens and start their maturity as, as adults uh, at ease with their sexuality. Part of the reason for that is that the subject is now more readily discussed in the open, in the media, and that uh, certain people in public life are prepared to uh, be honest, and that of course has an impact on people who live in areas of the world or are of an age when it's difficult to be honest. Now, I understand that you screened um, the Frankenstein movies um, in preparation for doing the film. How would you say that the creature, or this whole Frankenstein myth, is kind of like a gay metaphor? Well, uh, it, uh, <laughs> I think you have to come and see Gods and Monsters. I mean, it, it's sort of discussed in that. It, it's, or, or not discussed, it's, it, this film isn't didactic at all. It's a, it's a work of art, it's very imaginative, and uh, it sets the audience's mind uh, racing in various di directions. But certainly Whale was sympathetic to the outsider. Now, he was an outsider himself in a number of ways. Yes, he was gay. Uh, he had escaped from his social past as a member of the working classes and turned himself into a, a middle-class gentleman in London, but he was an outsider when he arrived in Hollywood. He had seen the uh, destruction in the First World War at first hand and never forgotten it, but I don't know with what guilt he considered uh, his own life and the fact that he, he'd escaped death himself. So. I think the monster is, to, 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 to reduce the monster uh, uh, as a metaphor for um, what it means to be gay, I think would be uh, to, to, to misunderstand the intention. It's, it's, it's broader than that and perhaps a bit deeper. Now, you, you did mention a bit of a connection between you, know, you and, and Whale himself, being an Englishman, um, going to Hollywood. Do you see any differences between that time when he was in Hollywood, was an outsider, or do you still feel a you know, a bit of an outsider now? Well, uh, since AIDS has meant that uh, the public has uh, had to consider that gay people have sex and even think of the ways in which they have sex, there is an openness now uh, in, for the public at large. Uh, uh, and that's the one good thing to have come out of AIDS, I think, that, that, that now uh, gay uh, people are understood to be firmly uh, uh, in society. Uh, and so attitudes in Hollywood uh, are beginning to reflect that in, in, in the films being made, Gods and Monsters being one, the, um, the opposite of sex being another, a real grown-up movie where gay and straight characters exist side by side and are laughed at and are cried over in exactly the same way. Uh, nothing remarkable about us, we're just uh, uh, different, uh, but not threatening or whatever. Um, as for people living in Hollywood and the film, working in the film industry, there is an increasing um, sense that it's okay to be out. Uh, studio bosses, agents, managers, 
directors, producers, writers, of course, uh, happily out of the closet, uh, even joining together and, and, and um, meeting in societies to, to discuss it. But actors, very few. Stars, only one, Anne Hesch. And I, th I think, uh, without burdening her too much, uh, we should all be watching her career with uh, the eager anticipation, I would say certainty, that the public doesn't give a damn that she's gay. Uh, finds it interesting, perhaps, but uh, isn't going to let, them, uh, let, let it affect the, the enjoyment of her work when she plays a straight character, which she very successfully does. I think the, the public is a great deal more sophisticated than those advisors of young actors particularly, their, their managers and PR people, who may themselves be gay, uh, who advise the young person, no, 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 if you want to have a career in, in Hollywood, uh, you must lie. Well, that's unseemly uh, and it's cruel. And there's no career, frankly, worth having if it means you're going to spend the whole of your life lying about yourself. Uh, but if you choose to have a career uh, uh, as an actor and you want to play uh, romantic leads, follow Anne Hesh's example and it's probably going to be okay. Get out. Hmm. Um, what was it like working with Bill and Lynn Redgrave on this film? It was a very quick shoot. I think it was only four weeks. We didn't have enough money for any more than that. Three million dollars isn't a lot to, f uh, to spend on a film that looks as good as this one does. Mm -hmm. uh, Lynn, I've known all my working life. We first acted together with Laurence Olivier at the Old Vic uh, 30 years ago. And uh, I've seen her off and on. And um, the fact that she can give a wonderfully rich, broad comic performance didn't surprise me. I've seen her do similar things in the past. Uh, so it was lovely to see her again, and we always laugh a lot together. And that was a characteristic of my relationship with the director, Bill Condon. We, we, we laugh together. We have the same sense of, sense of humor. He's, um, he's from New York, uh, which I find easy to relate to, uh, being here quite a lot myself. Uh, he loves not only the film industry, but he loves theater as well. And so uh, references to things in my own life uh, and, and career, uh, he was able to uh, uh, relate to absolutely. And as for him directing me as an actor, I rapidly learned to totally trust him. And if he was happy uh, and said, cut, that's fine, uh, I really believed him. And that's a very good relationship to have with uh, a director because it means however much you go off on your own as, as the camera's turning and uh, perhaps trying something new, something you didn't expect to happen, uh, does happen and you go with it. Uh, Bill would always let you know at the end whether what he'd seen was right for his movie or not. I totally underestimated how wonderful the film would be. I had no idea that it would look as beautiful as it does, that the, uh, the stock of colour film that they were using would be so specific, that it would be so stylish, or indeed as funny as it is. And uh, so I'm in awe and uh, hope to work with uh, Bill again another time. Now, you mentioned it's funny, but there's also a lot of darkness in the film and the dark side. How is Gods and Monsters different from current Hollywood films that have come out the past few years, like In and Out or even <coughs> The Object of My Affection? I haven't seen either of those movies, so mm -hmm. I can't uh, tell you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask a little bit about um, the producer, Clive Barker. Did you have any uh, interaction with him? No, that was uh, an initial uh, <clears throat> um, reassurance that the, f the film was uh, well-intentioned because um, Clive Barker is, uh, until the ascendance of Bill Condon perhaps, uh, you know, the master of, of the, the horror genre uh, these days. And, uh, but a apart from meeting him a couple of times, his input, I think, was in getting the movie set up, in overseeing the, the, the script initially and who knows in what way supporting Bill, but uh, he was not often on the set, and uh, no, it, uh, his, his job was very much behind the scenes as far as I was concerned. Um, you mentioned that you and Bill share a love of theater. Um, are you still performing a night out um, anywhere, and how is that going? No, the last time I talked to your program was uh, four years ago during the Gay Games when I 
had for which I devised my town. Since then, I, I, I've done it in a number of places. Uh, most recently in, in Los Angeles, raising money for uh, local charities, uh, gay charities and, and youth charities. Uh, I took it across um, uh, South Africa uh, at the time when they were uh, trying to ensure, which they now have, that the equality clause in, in the constitution of the country should uh, include uh, uh, sexuality. So it is now illegal on any grounds to discriminate um, against someone who's gay in South Africa. And I did my uh, show to raise funds for people who were trying to make that happen. No, it's, it's put, I nearly said, back in the closet. It's put in the back of a drawer and, and it'll come out uh, when the time's appropriate. But I'm still acting in the theatre. I've just done uh, ten weeks with an Ibsen play in Los Angeles. I'm now rehearsing for a Chekhov play and a Noel Coward play and a Shakespeare play in the West Yorkshire Playhouse in the north of England where I'm going to stay for seven months with a company of ten actors. Well, when you, you pull that play out again from your closet in the future, does it evolve? Does it change every time you perform it? Yes, it does. Uh, uh, it, it's always uh, a night out in wherever I happen to be, and, uh, and the local concerns become my concerns as well. And, uh, and uh, of course, the part of the fun and point of, of doing a solo show and looking the audience directly in the eye is to uh, communicate, and, and uh, it, to that extent, it's, it's a two-way process. Uh, also, I don't think the show is yet right, uh, or, or has reached um, a state that I would ever consider recording it, for example, in some way. So, it's got more work to be done on it, and I assume that will happen over um, the next time I do it, and the time I do it after that, and the time I do it after that, wherever it happens to be. Um. Well, I think that's all I have to ask. Was it okay if you do um, an in the life identification for us? Look sure. at the camera. I'll just say um, I'm in Ian McKellen and you're watching In the Life. Is he looking right to camera? Yes, he's looking right okay. to camera. Hold on one second, please. And anytime. I'm Ian McKellen and you're watching In the Life. Great. Thank you. Thanks very, very much. Okay. Uh, yep, so once you're rolling, let's count. Okay. 12, 13, 14. Right. Good. And anytime. Bill, what got you interested in um, doing this film, Gods and Monsters? I think it started with an interest in James Whale's movies. Um, first one I discovered was Bride of Frankenstein. And after that, as I got older, I saw as many as I could. And um, I think it was Clive Barker who said, if there's any doubt about the existence of a gay sensibility, The Bride of Frankenstein proves that part of it is, you know, his movies are just full of a kind of camp wit that is as fresh today as it was 60 years ago. And also this amazing sort of identification with the outsider that runs throughout all of his movies. So that was the first thing. And then, and then um, that drew me to Christopher Bram's novel, Father Frankenstein which I thought was absolutely wonderful, but also that rare serious book that wouldn't be diminished by being made into a film. I thought it was a possibility to do a movie about the end of James Whale's life and sort of do it in the style of Whale to a degree. So you kind of knew that Whale was gay even before you read Christmas Oh, sure, Bell? yeah. I have a friend, Curtis Harrington, who's a director who knew Whale in the last 10 years of his life, and he always told me wonderful stories about him. Yeah, so, and I mean, he is a bit of a gay hero, I think. Uh, someone who was openly uh, homosexual uh, from the 1930s on, never hit it, never led a double life in any way, and was wildly successful. Do you need that again? Yeah. Uh, hold yeah. on. Okay. Don't ask me why people are banging in the door. <laughs> right. Okay. Can't stop them. Um, you can repeat that. What? Yeah. Um, no, I knew about him from a friend of mine, Curtis Harrington, a director who knew him in the last 10 years of his life. Heard had heard great stories about him, and of course, um, he's a bit of a gay hero because he was someone who was openly gay in the 1930s all the way through the 1950s and um, thrived in spite of it. What do you think is going to happen to one of our most cherished American icons, you know, this image of Frankenstein, <laughs> you know, it's like Marilyn Monroe and James right. Dean. How is that going to affect people's perceptions of both straight people and gay people to know? That I don't know. It's interesting because, you know, part of getting the rights to use it, it was difficult. I actually had a friend who works there and gave it to us kind of without them knowing, you know, because uh, Frankenstein for Universal 
is a bit like Mickey Mouse for Disney, you know. So um, I don't know. I don't think that this will redefine everybody's image of Frankenstein, but it is another little, little variation on it, definitely. Um, why did you want Ian in this role of James Will? Well, he just seemed like the obvious choice, um, especially, I mean, I'd seen him on stage in so many things. And then seeing Richard III especially, the way that he was so full of mischievous delight every time he invited you to watch the next horrible thing that he did, you know, I thought that that would, it was important because Will in the beginning, it's certainly not a PC character, you know, he does things that um, can put off certain, he's an older uh, gay man who still has sexual urges, who sort of, any young guy within 500 feet, he tries to get them to take their clothes off, certain predatory things like that, which I think is, uh, it's being shown from the inside rather than the outside, and I thought that was important to have someone like Ian who could, who could sort of make, take you along with the character. Also, I thought there was going to be some fun to be had. Ian is so, so well known as a political activist and um, is such a contemporary out gay figure. The play between that and someone like Whale, who was out, and out doesn't even apply in the 50s, but who was openly, comfortably homosexual in the 50s, but doesn't have any of that sort of extra political kind of um, uh, bite that someone, a contemporary figure has. So it's fun to watch, I think, someone like Ian play in, in period. Yeah, that must have been interesting to direct him. I mean, there are times where you had to like Tell him, you know, not so political or... No, not at all. No, no. no. That wasn't... Ian, no. That's great. Um, what was Clive Barker's involvement with this production? Well, first, um, he... I think it's something he wants to do more of. He um, was kind of our Coppola on this movie, you know, just kind of there to help us get it going, to help us get it financed, always stepping in at the, those critical moments when... It looked like it was going to fall apart. And then as a great sounding board, because there are so many um, comparisons, obviously, parallels between Clive's life and Wales. You know, northern lads, expats living in Hollywood, making films, painters, and also uh, gay. So um, he was always fun to talk to about it. Um, what You mentioned some of those connections. How are some things that are different and yet the same for gay directors like yourself or Barker now compared to Wales time? Well, that's a good question. Um, I guess it's less of an issue now. I think it's less of an issue now. Um, but again, what's w interesting about Wales is that he n made no effort to hide anything then. So I think it was a pretty sophisticated culture in the 1930s in Hollywood. I think the war happened and suddenly all of America, everyone felt like they needed real men. And so there was that followed by the Cold War made everything kind of clamp down. But um, I don't know that it's that different from the 1930s, you know. Um, I've never sensed any kind of real bias just in terms of being gay. You know, there's probably more of a bias uh, for Clive and me in terms of in virtue of the fact that we do horror movies, you know. That, uh, that's much more of a stigma, I think. Um, the characters that Lynn Redgrave and Brendan Fraser play, are they based on any real-life counterparts? Well, Lynn Redgrave uh, plays a Hungarian housekeeper, Hannah, and in real life, um, Will had two middle European, a housekeeper and a cook, Anna and Johanna, so she's a bit of a combination. Um, he used to, when people would come back for dinner a second time, he, he'd line them up and ask people to identify which was which. I think that was one of his games. Clay, no. Clay is an invention of, of Chris Bram's. Pure invention, as is Hannah, but Hannah is closer to somebody who lived, who existed in Wales' life. Um, you mentioned that there are some aspects of James Wales' character in your film and in the story that are a bit un PC for these times. Yeah. But I find that refreshing, you know, compared to some of the films that have been coming out of Hollywood. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, I think I almost feel like I've loved, I mean, obviously, we all grew up with all those hideous images of gay people in movies. Vito Russo wrote a book about them. Uh, and in the last 10 years, there's been, it seems to me, kind of two big movements. There's political, queer film, and then a more mainstream kind of um, gay lifestyle movie, sort of like with mostly positive, you know, um, depictions, role models, you know. Um, and they've been great, a great corrective to everything that happened before, but it does feel like maybe now we're moving into a time when we can sort of show a more complete picture again, you know characters who do have dark sides, characters who even behave in ways that might be considered 
um, uh, offensive to straight people, but again, showing them from the inside and not sort of as these alien others, you know, the way they were, were before. Um, it reminds me of something that happened in, in black movies, it seems to me, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the great stride that was made by Sidney Poitier, and it was wonderful, but he was so heroic. I think it was Pauline Kael who said that he has to practically win a Nobel Prize before he's able to kiss the white girl, you know. And then there's another generation that comes along, Spike Lee and other people saying, no, 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 this, there's like a more complicated picture, you know. It sounds like um, you've gotten some success. Audiences are ready for this kind of depiction. Um, success right. in your uh, That's of the title, Gods and Monsters. Well, it's, um, it's a quote from The Bride of Frankenstein, Dr. Pretorius, the very fruity character played by Ernest Thesiger, lifts his glass and says, to a new world of gods and monsters. But obviously, it has a lot of meanings. I hate to be too literal about it, but I do think that in, in the movie, uh, both Ian McKellen and Brendan Fraser, the characters they play, are at, at, at times either a god or a monster, you know, and it really is the story of that sort of back and forth between those two characters. We were talking about how audiences seem to be ready for this kind of film. Yeah. Um, tell me some of the reactions you just wanted well, to Well, it, it was interesting, for example, we showed the movie at Sundance. We had a really good response there, but when they show movies there, they do one screening at Salt Lake City. And we were a little nervous about that, because there was, like, it would get there, and there's, like, a significant Mormon, you know, uh, uh, part of the audience, and that was the best screening we had, you know? So I found that, you know, there's been, there was certain resistance in the beginning from bigger independent uh, distributors to, to um, Release the movie, and I wouldn't say it's because it was a gay movie only, but that was that, in addition to the fact that it's a kind of darker story and ends in in um, uh, James Will's suicide. I think probably all those things on top of it. But gay gay had a good deal to do with that, and I've always found that I never want to walk away from the the you know saying it's not a gay film, but it really isn't. You know, it it so I would be interested. I'm I'm hoping that. Um, I don't know. It, obviously, that it reaches as wide an audience as possible. Great. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Thank you very much.